He can't type, but he does speak in all caps. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. A choice we're going to mandate you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. I love that about you. Exhibit's running a couple minutes late. Can't wait. We will bring him in as soon as he uh, enters the building. And then ironically, we were going to talk about Lauren Hill and her latest <laughs> TMZ dust up where she was a little bit late for a concert. She's and- known to be late. Well, I have a very interesting story involving her and being late. But do you want to talk about her being late on Saturday first? Yes, and okay. then we'll, we'll backtrack. First off, our own Emmy was at the concert. Yeah, so this is at Crypto.com Arena. Right. So, Emmy, you rolled into your seat about 7.30. Yeah, so we rushed it. Uh, obviously, things are different now that uh, we had a baby, so we had to plan ahead. Uh, had dinner. Made it to the show, got our drinks, got into our seats around 7.30. Then uh, rumors started speculating, or started circulating that uh, she was going to be late. Then the couple next to us said that their daughter saw it on TikTok that she's usually a couple of hours late. <laughs> hours um, late? Wow. Yeah, it turned in from 8.30, 9, and then finally 9.30 we start to hear like, all right, she's about to take the stage. It seems like the people at the venue also were well aware of this, and they were telling us, like, yeah, she's probably going to be 9, 9.30. Very nonchalant about it. Mm-hmm. So and h- how long before the time your ass hit the seat, and I know it got up off the seat a few times to get drinks, but your ass hit the seat and the time she took stage? Honestly, they barely gave us any time. We had already gotten our drinks. We were walking back, and she was already on stage. What time? What time was this? <laughs> right, I like should rephrase that question. Nine forty-ish. How long? Okay, so seven thirty is when your ass hit the seat. This is straight. Know, up. This is nine. We're we're talking about nine thirty now when she actually hit the stage. Okay, yeah. I Emmy. Mean, what I'm trying to define is how long between the time you the got delay? there. You, th- this is what we're discussing, Seven thirty right? to nine thirty is two hours. Two hours, yes, two hours. Delay. That That's That is straight up disrespect to the audience. I to agree. The, the people working, <clears throat> unless unless they're making more money in concessions, which I'm sure they were. <laughs> but how much were the? Were, how much of the audience was savvy to this? Like when you sat down at seven thirty, were there any other foolish believers? <laughs> oh yeah, there were, there was plenty of people seated and getting ready. Uh, everyone was wondering who was going to open for her. Then the rumors mm-hmm. started going that it was just the Fugees and that's it. She needs fish to open for. Yeah, just jam. <laughs> just, just do quadrophenia for three hours. All right. So, did you know Emmy that you like? Were you expecting her to be late? Like at all? You've never heard this. No, no. We this just is found an out. ongoing. Thing. She, oh, is, she it, has it, a reputation. It goes back to 96, I'm here to tell you. Yeah. 1996. I even have a statement from her from 2016 <laughs> explaining why she's usually late. What was that statement? So she put this on her Facebook. I'll just I'll read it. I don't show up late to shows because I don't care. Mm. And I have nothing but love and respect for my fans. The mm. challenge respect. The challenge is aligning my energy with mm. the time. Ah. Taking something that isn't easily classified or contained and trying to make it available for others. Now, she's kind of making it seem that she's late because, and, and it's actually epic and, and we want her to be late so she has the right energy. If you watch this video that um, was taken at the show Emmy went to, mm-hmm. it's pretty crazy. She riles the crowd up, gets them back on her side. This is two hours later. 210, Gordon to Emmy. Is there not a curfew? Is there like. Well, I can get into that too. Okay. But uh, let's watch we'll, some of this we'll video. play the clip from Saturday. She's late. She's late to lot. Yo, y'all lucky I make it on this blood on stage every night. You're lucky I make it on the stage every night? Wow. I wish I had People one ounce of that. I'm secretly I jealous. Oh, I'm a believer now. Oh, I'm, I'm with her. Let's, I'm with her. Let's not work God into this tardy equation. Community. When there was no support, when the album sold so many records, and no one showed up and said, "Hey, would you like to?" Who did she bring on stage? Record? There's like an old lady standing behind her. I'm I'm hoping and they're related. Kids. She brings her family out before she goes out. She's like, "I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna get him back on my side." Well, maybe it's a thing. Like, if you met Don Rickles and he didn't insult you, 
you would be disappointed. <laughs> and if you went to a Lauren Hill concert and she wasn't two hours late, maybe you would be disappointed. I maybe want that's the full her experience. Thing. Yeah. Well, so as I was hearing this story on TMC, I was hearkening back to a situation which could have been used as a what we call a teachable moment back in 1996. 19, where were you all at in 1996? Well, I'll tell you where I was at. I was at the uh, K-Rock Weenie Roast in Irvine Meadows. And I think I have the bands. So I have the actual Whoa, yeah, the, pamphlet. The program. <clears throat> Red Hot Chili Peppers, no doubt. Oh, wow. This is crazy. This is better than Coachella. Kiss. The Verve Pipe, who was very hot yeah. at the time. The Fugees. Corn, Lush. Three, oh, 311. Yeah. Garbage, who I like quite a bit. Mm. Goldfinger, good dudes. Yep. Great band. Yeah, except for their drummer, Darren, had a cash bar at his wedding. Darren. I was like, why am I going to a wedding where I have to buy a drink? <laughs> Sportsman's Lodge. But he knows I love him. Art and uh, the f- folks over there at Everclear were one of the bands. So this is a, this a loaded lineup. Yeah. Uh, I go to that today, <clears throat> any day. Oh, yeah. So the way Irvine Meadows works and the way this concert works is... You have, you know, 10 or 12 bands or 11 bands or whatever it is, right? And Single stage. Single stage with a hard out. The hard out is midnight, but it's probably earlier. It's probably like 1130 or something like that. And there's a curfew. And for every five minutes you go past the curfew, you get charged $10,000. Yeah, you get fined. The artist or the concert Whoever's like, promoting the promote concert. It, yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess the, whoever's promoting the concert could go try to get it back from the artist. It might be a contract. But yeah. that would mean it was one artist. It could be all the artists could tack on 10 minutes to their set and yeah. bump the whole thing back an hour and a half. You see what I'm saying? You got to run a tight ship. So how do they run that tight ship? Like, how do they make sure that everybody does their time? You know, um, and it's probably... You know, the Verve Pipe probably does 25 minutes and Kiss is allotted 40 minutes or the Red Hot Chili Peppers have, you know, 311 does 20 and and, and no doubt does 40 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the math's They're, already done. They do the math. And the way they do it, because I've stood on that stage a million times, is they have a giant turntable. The stage is a giant turntable. Big Lazy Susan. Giant Lazy Susan. Band gear, yeah. Probably 40 foot by 40 foot, maybe 50 by 50. And there's a partition wall that goes right down the middle of it. Sure. You've seen it before. They still use it. And they set that turntable on a clock, and that bitch starts turning. Which I love, because there's no downtime between bands. It's just all back to back. No, the thing starts turning, and half the time the other bands are playing as they're coming around the corner, which is pretty cool. But it's unthinkable to try it any other way. Because if you did this with comedians and you just told everyone, you know, <laughs> Dave Chappelle, you get 30 minutes tight, you know, and Joe Rogan, you, you get this, or Bill Burr, everyone would run it by 10 minutes. And then by the, the last comedian would go up, it'd be 2.30 in, in the morning. Yeah. Yes, we have a, have a picture of it. So wow. great night. But what they do is they start turning. And... They just start turning it when your time, your allotment is done. Now, they don't care. (laughs) They don't really care if you're late or you're early or how long into your set. And so what happened was, is Lauren Hill and the Fugees were late. So they got onto the stage late. And by the time they got on the stage, and I think I'm remembering this correctly, they got five minutes into their set, but they were 25 minutes late, and they just started turning. <laughs> so they didn't I think even play their hit. the Fugees were pissed, but the rules are the rules. There's no other way to run this. So Lauren Hill could have used that as a teachable moment at the time mm-hmm. and seen the error in her ways and corrected this back in 1996 when the turn. Now, there's two approaches. There's two types of people when the stage starts turning on you five minutes into your set. Okay. There's the people who blame themselves and then possibly correct. And then there's the people, and there's more and more of these people who are angry at the guy who's turning the stage. 
It's an attack now. That's the incorrect way to do it because for that, there was no r- road towards salvation, redemption, or improvement. But if you internalize and you go, next time I won't be late, then we can solve this problem. But most people, especially these days, are angry at the person turning the stage, even though it's clear it's laid out. You yeah. got to be there. You got to be set up and you got to be ready to go at your allotted time. And then you have 20 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever it is. But we will turn that stage. There's no other possible way you could put on a show like this with 11 big bands that didn't run the light at the end. Yeah. It's you impossible. Can't, you can't, or, or I've seen uh, one time, my, one of my first shows in, in high school as a band, we playing our talent show. And during the rehearsal, I couldn't hear my guitar. So when it came to the actual show, I turned it up a few notches. Yeah. And the guy running the show shut off all the electricity on the stage. And really? the lights and everything just turned off. All you heard was the, just the acoustic drums. And then he gets on the P and goes, you turned your guitar up and you didn't tell me about it. Please uh, please turn it down. Wow. And can continue Passive the show. aggressive. It was the most Sound embarrassing tech. thing ever. Well, you know, in comedy... They give you, you know, you go around town, you do a set, you do a 15 minute set, and then they ask you when do you want to be lit? And it's always two minutes before the end. So you got a 15 minute set. However long your closing joke is. And they'll run, they'll light you. It's 13 minutes, and now it's time to tell that last joke and, and wrap it up. But guys will run the light for sure. And, you know, if that guy's someone's name you recognize, they'll let you run the light. I, I think it's a shit policy for comedians. I, I really do. Because there's always like three guys waiting to go up. And then there's a late show usually. If it's 15, it's 15. Try to mm. try to stick with it. But uh, at some point, if they haven't heard of you or you're not, you know, you're not Bill Maher, they'll shut the mic. Like at a certain point, if you're going to ignore the light, they're going to just saying, yeah. pull the plug. But which if, you have a, to you. if you have a stage that will just rotate you right off, comedy clubs should do that. <laughs> <laughs> just, and I don't even know, like, for all I know, Irvine Meadows is automated. Like, maybe they punch it all into a computer there, beforehand. There, that can't be. That can't well, be. There is, that is a possibility. Um, there is a, uh, most shows, especially like take U2, for instance, most big shows, there's a countdown clock. And as soon as this clock starts, because there are so many light cues and music cues, as soon as this clock, clock starts, you are 59, 59 away from showtime and everything has to be on time. Hmm. So I don't know that Irvine Meadows did that at that show way back then Mm -hmm. Um, but but yes it is a thing was it was it all the fujis that were late the other all three of them i could have been just lauren i don't i don't remember i you know i'm I'm roaming around backstage drinking a beer with the boss tones who weren't even on the (laughs) menu that year get white back in here but i'm just i'm roaming around having a good time i just noticed the scuttlebutt was where the fujis and then why are they turning their their stage And, uh, but they turned it now they must've turned it and it must've been empty for 20 minutes. If you think about it, that's what I'm saying. Well, I imagine if the Fugees weren't ready behind them in in setup, the last fan would just hit their last chord and they could just walk off. Yeah. So you don't actually need to turn it to an empty, an empty set. Well, I just, I, I was there, I, you know, back, if everyone had phones and camera phones and everything, we'd have footage of it now. I believe you. I mean, we this don't is, have footage of it. This but is a pattern. This it, is right on par with. It was what the Fuji's, and I've, they were going third too. So if they kicked it back another half hour at just going third when there's ten or eleven bands, everyone gets kicked back that that time period. So there you go. Early uh, Lauren Hill K Rock. I don't think she ever came back to play another. K Rock Weenie Roast, but maybe an acoustic Christmas. All right. Um, I saw something I've never uh, seen before, which is a lizard doing some good. I've seen I've seen a lot of lizards these days. To, they usually have to no good. They're troublemakers. They <laughs> run around, they pretend to be scared of you, but they're not. They scurry, <laughs> they scare you, but they're never doing anything to benefit you. And then once in a while, they get in your house. 
And then it becomes weird mm-hmm. because you can't kill a lizard they're, because they're that, just right past that threshold. They're where past it's, the it's threshold. Gross. Yeah. yeah. It, it stops at like cockroach. Mm-hmm. Once you go past cockroach, now it's big game. Yeah. <laughs> now you have to catch them, bag them, and tag them like yeah. I do. <laughs> no, now it. you got to get the Tupperware bowl out. And you got to capture them. Oh, I see. And then you got to slide, slide the... some piece of mail or something yeah. under it, and you have to transport them outside. You can't kill a lizard inside, A, because it's a mess. B, it's like, I don't even draw a big distinction between killing a horse and killing a lizard. You're, no, you're right. There is a threshold uh, after cockroach. Yes. Where I, like, mouse, Drops off. I can um, go silverfish. Silverfish, yeah. All day. Easy. I can do anything, but once I get past cockroach size-wise, I'm pretty much out. I don't know what I would do with a salamander. That yeah, that's that's or even a small scorpion. That. But yeah. all right, so I see a lizard, and I see lizards everywhere now, and I think it had something to do with COVID. I just started seeing them smash into the street. I see them run all over the sidewalk. If you walk around this neighborhood, you're going to step on a lizard at some point. Yeah, I've seen. And um, I happened upon a lizard a few days ago in this neighborhood and I saw him and he saw me and there was a bee about four inches in front of the lizard and the lizard just ate the bee. And I've never seen a lizard eat. I've seen a million lizards. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a lizard eat. I've never seen a squirrel shit. I've seen millions of squirrels and millions of lizards, but I've never, they must do both. They must do both. But I've never seen a squirrel shit. I've never stepped in squirrel shit. I never washed my car and went, oh, man, squirrel shit on my hood. I've never seen it. Don't know what it looks like. Never never seen a squirrel squat in a log or anything. <laughs> You've never seen that? <laughs> you'd think you'd be hit by something from a tree. Or step in it. Step in it or just have it hit you because you're standing so under a tree squirrels. and there's a million squirrels. And never seen it. Eat, yeah. But I've never, ever seen a lizard eat. And it ate. And not only did it eat, it ate a bee, which could possibly sting me. Right, so, so I, the bee I was salute alive. the lizard world. Was, was yeah. it the kind where it sticks out its tongue and it brings it in? Yeah, just it... took a step, snatched it with its tongue, ate it, ate it down. I mean, the bee was the size of the lizard's head. I don't know. Maybe that's, that's a way to eat. I wonder if I just ate like a, like a cow and then didn't eat for seven weeks. You know what mm. I mean? Maybe that's a more efficient way. Yeah. Not as fun. Lizards don't, yeah, they don't come across food as easily as we do, so they have to think ahead. Yeah, the, they plan. So now you owe this lizard a favor. I just, what I've always said is whenever they try to, t- there's always some asshole that talks up spiders. You know what I mean? Oh, I it, hear it all the time. The, don't kill them. Add that. No. They're so good. They, they kill they, they the, get, the stuff the you mosquitoes. don't like. They get the mosquitoes. They'll get the silverfish. They'll get a cockroach. I believe like, all the spiders just yeah, crawling around my yeah, house. Yeah, because they're there. They're like my own security detail protecting my home. Yeah. And I'm like, are they? Because I've never seen one eat <laughs> something that I don't want in my house. They certainly, of, they certainly build their houses in our corners and, uh, and make them all gross at the webs. The, I see that. They're growing everywhere. They're hanging down everywhere. I was walking out front two days ago. I ran into the spider web thing and started doing the invisible crazy man dance with the arms Ugh. flailing about because you think the spider's on you, uh, but it's I've, not just I've a made, leaf hanging from it. I've made so many deals with spiders, uh, mental deals. Of course, like there's one time where I saw a spider on the ceiling and my wife hates spiders mm-hmm. and I'm so tired. And I think, okay, if she sees this spider, I'm going to have to get a step stool. I'm going to have to oh, kill yeah. it. I'm going to have to deal with it. Yeah. And I just want to go to bed. So before I turn off the lights, I look at the spider and I think, hey, you can live. I'm going to turn off the light. Just be gone when we wake up and we both go on with our lives. I got one of those vacuums once. <laughs> they don't really sell them anymore. And the reason I don't, I don't see them around is they have an insect vacuum. You ever seen this? Well, I, I have like one of those those vacuums. That's why they don't sell them anymore because Black and Decker just <laughs> like makes their own cordless thing with this tube yeah. on it, and you can just you can just use that. Sure, but, but I want a live. I, I think the spider would still be alive in my vacuum, and I don't like. The it's thought unclear of that. how how it works. <laughs> but oh, anyway, I turn on the lights. Liz, lizards sit around beehive entrances to eat. I didn't know that. Oh, they're straight up the. They're Predator. bee hunters. Yeah. All right. You turn the light turn on. Turn the light on the next morning. Mm-hmm. Spiders on top of my wife. Really? She screams. Making sweet love? Making, yeah, it was... I got cucked by a spider. Mm. 
Black Widow. Yeah. And um, so there's that. And then also I saw a huge spider in our backyard built. It's like one of those wolf spiders that yes. has intricate webs. Yes. Seen huge. Like it's, it's actually beautiful. This It web. is. It's majestic. And, uh, but you and, hate it. And Jen pulls me aside. She says, hey, you're going to have to take care of the spider outside. I got a different policy on outdoor it's spiders. That's their it's like they're <laughs> they're on their side. You know what I mean? Like once you tunnel under our border and head into our country, I'm coming to get you. Yeah, right. But if I, you I'm want to stay way. in Tijuana, that's your business. I'm the same way, but I don't I'm not uh gonna argue with my wife, so I think, okay, I'll take care of the spider. So I put my shoes on, I I'm heading outside, and the spider's now racing across the web. Like it caught something. Mm-hmm. And um and I think, okay, well, the spider's now very active. I don't want to deal with it while it's active. And it's starting to wrap up what looks like a bug, just kind of the way they wrap, they spin yeah, the bug they around. Yeah, they spin them. That's a crazy thing it's to a, see. It's crazy to see. I'm watching this happen, but I realize the web's getting smaller. Mm-hmm. And then the web is now gone. And the, what the spider did was it wrapped up its entire web and just went, went away. Packed it up. Packed it up and left. Like Gypsy it knew I was, spider. I was Rambling coming. spider. I didn't know they did that, yeah. So you didn't have to go I on a hunt. I didn't have to do it. And he, yeah, he's living a, a happy life. I have... In my neighborhood, those giant wolf spiders. And the scariest thing is when you see them and the street light or the porch light hits it just <laughs> oh, right yeah. and throws the shadow on the wall. It's like and a it Hitchcock looks like movie. a seven <laughs> foot spider's there. Yeah. Like you go, fuck, what? And you're looking up at it, the moon coming through it, and it, it's so menacing. But here's my problem my problem is my neighborhood, and these wolf spiders come out like two months out of the year. Mm-hmm. And they drop down and they, they cast these huge webs and they're huge and scary looking. It is a weird thing that a medium-sized spider weighs, and I'm going to make this up, you know, two grams. And then a huge spider weighs four grams. But I'm 210 pounds. Why should I be scared of the one that has an extra two grams on it? Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're right. It's like I, I am though. I a can't. small spider is the size of my small toe, and a big spider is the size of my big toe. I have no fear of the small spider, but I'm terrified of the one that's the size of my big toe. Even though I can step on both of them, it's neither just one seems of them poses so a threat. Much more substantial. I, I know, but it's like a couple of milligrams. Don't care. I know. So <laughs> I live in a neighborhood where these oak trees form a canopy over a lot of the streets. Oh. And it they connect, and they form a tunnel of oak trees. Yeah, it's, and it's when you're And when you're walking at night, you will run into one of these things that slid Ooh. down even in the middle of the street. And so what I try to do is I try to walk the path of the car. I try to figure out where the car would go, fig- figuring the car would tear down the web yeah. exhibits here now, I think. And that's that's the way. That's the way I do it. But yes, scared of spiders. Don't know why. No one's no spiders ever caused harm to me. Never never been stung by what no, no roach. No. Nothing has ever no insect other than the mosquito, which we should hate. The, uh, the other ones are all I do hate them. Good. I'm glad. They, all they, right. They serve no purpose. I think exhibits here. It's good enough time to uh, take a break. Rob Reiner's going to join us uh, in the uh, fourth quarter here. So I think what we should do is rather than just bring Exhibit in while we're doing the show, why don't we just break five minutes early and we'll bring Exhibit in. Let's go. We'll we'll do that right after this. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can be a lot. Oh, the holidays, the family, the stress. Oh, boy, it's all going down, isn't it? And uh, that's stress. You need a little change. How about a little therapy? Therapy can make you feel grounded, give you tools to manage everything that's going on. Um, Big fan of therapy, always been involved in it. And, um, you know, it's kind kind of what my family's business is. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, convenient, and it's flexible. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. So this will save you time. It'll save you money. Get your head right, and then go out and conquer the world with better help. Right, Dawson? 
Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Corolla today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Corolla. Just thrive. Oh, so much stress. You just want to hit the pause button in life and breathe. Just calm from Just Thrive. Well, they can help. Just Calm's all-natural blend of mood-lifting, psychobiotics, and brain-nourishing B vitamins help you take back control and feel your most cool, calm, and collected self. Multiple studies prove it works quickly to soothe everyday stress and sharpen focus in as little as four weeks, or you can try Just Drive Probiotic. I take that every day, a spore probiotic that banishes gas and bloat so your gut can produce more serotonin. That's your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep as well. These guys are a great couple. I uh, Tina was on the show, Tina Anderson, and uh, went out to dinner with her and her husband. They're very big believers in this product. That's why they created it. And uh, the gut, well, that controls the mind, baby. So let's get it in order. Just thrive. I'm on it. You should be on it too. Am I right, Dawson? With Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic, you'll have the ultimate stress-fighting duo to help you feel cool, collected, and in control. Get 20% off your first 90-day bottle of Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic today. Visit JustThriveHealth.com and use promo code ADAM. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Adam, hi. This is Ben. I heard my dog barking and walked outside and turns out he was barking at an elderly gentleman and his wife who were walking up. I, I introduced myself and apologized, and it turns out he said his name was Shelby Coffee. I said, Shelby Coffee, I know who you are. You're the former editor of the LA Times, and, and I know you through the Adam Carolla show, and, and he had uh, really nice things to say about you. He talked all about the, the Blita and Reseda and, and all of that. Uh, give Shelby a call. I think he would appreciate it. Anyway, talk to you soon. Bye. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Yeah, when I was a boxing coach in Pasadena, he was one of my students, Shelby Coffey, the man who ran the Times, and he, he helped me, because when you're poor and you're not successful, sometimes <laughs> if you meet people who are successful, they go, we're not so different. Yeah. You could do this. <laughs> And then I did. Tammy Pettigrew is here and uh, also exhibit lasagna. Ganja is the name of the podcast. It's available wherever you find finer podcasts. Good to see you guys. Hey, thanks for having us, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll talk about the pod and the weed and all that stuff. But first, uh, you know, I'm a car guy, so we got to talk some car Let's stuff. Let's do that, too. <laughs> you, did, you did the gumball rally in 07 in Europe? Yes. William? I've done it. Actually, I've done it like four times, like three or four times. So you must, because you're the Pimp My Ride guy, they must have lots of rides for you on these kinds of events, right? Well, I mean, they're usually held in, like, Europe, and and it transfers back and forth. They, they, they have this thing where they start in London or somewhere around there, and you got all the, all the, the, the rally drivers, you know, on this course. It's 3,000 miles in three, four days. Wow. So so you're really pushing it. And, and um, you know, usually there's a part in the rally where you drive up onto this plane and fly somewhere with all the cars, land. Like, we, we for example, we left from, like, uh, like uh, what was that? Uh, uh, like Greece or something. And then we flew to Boston with all the cars. But usually I have a car built on site there, and then I drive it when I get there. Um, so it's all kinds of people from all type of walks of life and they all meet up for this one thing called the gumball rally. And if you have a chance to do it one time in your life, I'm saying you should do it. How do they evade the law? You don't, you don't, that is, yeah, yeah, that is part of it. Some of these guys walk around with briefcases full of euros to try to bribe the cops. (laughs) What? Some guys, yeah, yeah. So some guys go to jail. Yeah. That's a real thing. Yeah, it's not a race, so you have, still have to abide by the laws of gravity and shit like that. Yeah, you're your license <laughs> seized, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but they, I mean, they can't do shit with it. I I just got a new one when I got home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you, do you, what what do you say? You have these cars built for you. Do, what custom modifications do you? Uh, request? you, you I, well, I wanted to, like uh, for example, the last time I did it, I had a a, a Porsche, uh, you know, the 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 little SUV. 
um, uh, the the I had it bored out. I had the engine bored out, um, and then I, I fixed the fixed the exhaust so you could hear it, like like sounding like a Mustang from down the street. And uh, I knew I was going to blow the doors off of it because I knew I was going to be driving at high speed. I've done it a few times. I've done it in a Lambo. I've done it in a um, a, a Bentley. Yeah, that's that's the one. I had a board. I, oh, that was that was sick. Mm. Do you leave the car there? Do yeah, you it's buy a piece of shit when I'm you. done with. I beat the <laughs> shit out of it. Yeah, I, I beat it until there's nothing left. And so uh, when I when I when I burned that one out, it was just like the lights were on. It was like you you know you're gonna like kill this car. Yeah. So, Are you on the autobahn at some point? Absolutely. Like yeah, like we treat, but I try to be responsible as possible. But some of these guys come like ready for war. Like uh, like there was a there was a um, there was like a a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar Mercedes. You know the long the long front. I forget the name. Yeah, of it. the but, SL. Uh, they have an SL black. Right, you know like the problem with all those cars, all the super super the LFAs, the yeah. Lexus, the Mercedes, McLaren. Yes. I think it was. Goddamn Paris Hilton always buys one, <laughs> and then. It's a car, but but picture this. You work, let's just say you worked your whole life. You're a crazed car guy. You grew uh-huh. up poor. You started a business. You yeah. sold the business. All of a sudden, you're flush with cash, and you buy your dream car, this exquisite piece of German engineering, which right. is good for 230 miles an hour on the Autobahn. And next thing you know, Paris Hilton has her dog in her lap. <laughs> she's wrapped it pink, and she's pulling out front of Craig's in your yeah. car. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> she ruins it, and she got an LF. LFA, too. She got old. She gets the craziest. She's good high, taste, huh? An LFA is a piece of Japanese precision F1. It's a weapon. And she just goes and gets them. Yeah, exactly. And then puts around with yeah. a dog on her lap. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't even take it past 80. No. You know? No. All right. We got to do sex tapes, man. We're, we're yeah, behind Yeah, we're in the wrong business. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what kind of demand there'd be for us yeah, these days. Uh, I got a side of OnlyFans, but I got to do some male grooming. I don't know. Well, I got that. I got bad news for you. Yeah. You with a woman, that ain't moving the dial. Me with a woman, they ain't moving the dial. Yeah. But you and me together. Okay, all right. Sex tape for that. Any car you want. Yeah. There'd be a lot of curious yeah. curiosity, yeah. but just for pure I curiosity. I now. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's see what the pre-orders look like. <laughs> I think we could do this. And, you know, we'd have a contract. It'd be yeah, nothing okay, sexual. Cool, yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be all sex, but, I mean, a contract makes yeah, it kind yeah, of a really yeah, 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 keep it professional. Yeah, keep it professional. <laughs> all right, so how'd you two meet Tammy and Exhibit? Oh, man, I'll let Tammy say that. Yeah. Oh, man, how did we meet? Um, we met through people in the cannabis industry a few different times. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it came time for the lasagna ganja uh, Exhibit called me and said, hey, I have this idea, and I think you'd be perfect for it. And that's how. That Who started. is the big like? You know, I talk to guys like Jim Belushi. They're yeah. doing the cannabis thing. Mm-hmm. I remember Roseanne Barr. I think was was doing the cannabis yeah. thing. Yeah. And there's always Snoop and. But I don't know who who is the big player in terms of names we might recognize in this industry now. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people. When I say people, there's a lot of celebrities that think they can walk into cannabis mm-hmm. and sell cannabis like they sell alcohol or Lincoln Town cars or you know what I'm saying or, or any kind of thing that you usually see associated with um, celebrity mm-hmm. and their products. Cannabis is a different animal. Mm-hmm. Um, cannabis has to work. Um, it is not a fashion statement. It is not a protest statement, even though it is a politically driven subject. Um, cannabis has to work for the people that need it. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a medicine. It is something that is is it's been here, put here for us. It's been politicized. It's been demonized. It's been a lot of different things over the years because they don't know how to tax it. And they don't know how to put it in a category that they control it. Control is a big part of what the issue with cannabis is. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you can't control it. It is a seed. It's just like you can go out and grow some Fucking broccoli, you can go walk in back in your backyard, put this in the ground and it'll come up. You you can't do that with like chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco or or anything. It's a crop that needs to be done. But cannabis is fairly easy to grow. It'll mm-hmm. grow anywhere. Mm-hmm. So yeah. until they've been able to figure that part out, then I think that's why it's been like that. So to answer your question, um 
there are no big names per se that are ruling and controlling cannabis. It doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. There are there are activists that like Jim Belushi. Uh, uh, Jim Belushi is definitely a big face in cannabis. Um, there there are you know myself. You got Burner. You got Be Real. Um, oh they yeah, all, Be Real. Yeah, they're all different people that really understand. Um, what the audience and the culture is behind cannabis. So with that being said, there are people who come and go. Like you said, Roseanne Barr. You've seen Justin Bieber try to have a strain mm-hmm. of weed. You've seen all these other Whoopi. And they come in and fail. Whoopi. Oh, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. They come in and fail because either they they are, are here for the wrong reasons, they don't really respect the culture or the plant, mm-hmm. or they don't even consume themselves. They just think it's like the green brush, and mm-hmm. everybody wants to be involved and try to get themselves you know, in with the with the with the crowd, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to pinpoint who's the face of cannabis mm-hmm. right now. What uh, is going on with legalization versus the sort of bootleg stuff? Mm-hmm. I'll call it because mm-hmm. I can't get a straight answer on is this once they legalized it and taxed it, then why would all these guys kind of bootleg it? I mean, I understood prohibition. You made alcohol illegal and people want alcohol. So bathtub gin was invented and speakeasies. And that's mm-hmm. that's that's a natural offspring of, of, of what would happen if you did this. But then you legalized it. But then I keep hearing about all this illegal stuff. Is yeah. it How did that happen? Well, I mean, I don't want to pay 33% tax on anything. And that's oh. essentially what people have to do with cannabis now. So what the tax structure has basically done is incentivized the illicit market so the legacy market can still exist because if somebody's on a fixed income and they're using this as a medicine it's cheaper to go buy it from your local neighborhood dealer that kind of feels like family versus going to a dispensary and have it being sold to you like you're in an apple store and then you know here's the surprise 33 percent at the end you're welcome have a good day so that's why we still see the illicit market operating so do they get too greedy with the 33%? Absolutely. Like if they'd just gone with 9% or something, people would go into the Apple store and buy it? Cannabis, in, especially in California, and um, I can just speak from just operating in this market alone, not even, even going out to the rest of the states, um, it is overtaxed mm-hmm. um, by every step of the way is taxed. Mm-hmm. Um Alcohol is not tax, taxed like this. Cigarettes are not taxed like this. None of the things that um, are out that are potentially more harmful than what cannabis is are not even taxed a third of the way cannabis is. And what he means by that is like at every level, before there was a cultivation tax, they removed that. There's a manufacturing tax, distribution, retail. So it's taxed at every single le- at level. And, they, and like you said, there's no other industry that's doing this. So how can people survive? It's really not possible. You're just kind of watching a graveyard of brands go down this year, especially. It's pretty mm. depressing. Is there a state that's getting it right? <laughs> no. No, there's a lot of states that, you know, they'll tax you for THC percentage, right. which uh-huh. is essentially the same as taxing strawberries for being too red. Right. Because there's not going to be, <laughs> there's not necessarily going to be a difference just because it has a higher THC percentage. And honestly, a lot of these labs can kind of manipulate those numbers. We know that. Um, I don't think anybody has figured out. We The hope was on New York, that they would watch what California did and not do what we did. But we're watching them. <laughs> do what well, we I, they're so goddamn greedy mm-hmm. and they just want to wet their beak all mm-hmm. the time. And everything is bad until they can tax it. You know, mm-hmm. like the, the UFC is a horrible, barbaric. What? We sold out Madison Square Garden. All right. Yeah. Give us our money. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's yeah. all they do is everything is horrible mm-hmm. unless they get paid. Correct. Mm-hmm. And they always get greedy. And when they get greedy, they create another industry, which becomes a sort of back alley. Mm -hmm. But they were the bathtub gin Mm -hmm. is is what they is what they create. And I don't but they never learn their lesson. So it's Mm -hmm. they do the same. They did the same thing with productions. You act exhibit. Yes. They got really super greedy and taxi in Los Angeles. So all the productions moved out and they went to New Mexico, yes. Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta yeah. Prague, right. Canada. Yeah. They just went everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then at some point they go, well, even though 
we can't, even if we're taxing 30% of nothing, that's still nothing. So then they try to lure people back, but they get greedy mm. and people leave. That's Correct. why you're in Nevada now, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On top of a couple different things, but yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're making the run, you drove here today, right? Yes, I did. I did. I, I apologize for being late. Usually <laughs> I'm on uh, Lauren Hill time. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I'm not. I'm really good about being on time. Believe it or not, it's a big stickler of mine. Like I, like I, I was always taught. My father was a real military guy. So, oh man. So, so, so if I'm early, I'm on time. If I'm on time, I'm late. Yeah, that was has been my thing. So yeah. Well, all right. So let me ask you this: If you tell me if you notice this as a cannonball runner, mm-hmm. you know, driving from L.A. to Vegas, yeah. it's easy to pick up speed. Yes. And there's lots of straight highway, mm-hmm. and cars are good now, and they're quiet. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were growing up. They had wind wings in the side and suspension be (laughs) rattling and drum brakes. And you could feel 75 miles an hour. It felt like it sounded like 75 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Literally, my mom's VW Squareback would shimmy past 62. Like you got past six, you get the speed Speed wobbles wobbles at 62 and you'd have to back it down, you know. Sure. But it's easy to go 90 Mm -hmm. everywhere now. And I was talking to Dr. Drew about this. I'm not seeing nearly as many cops on the road handing out speeding tickets as there was pre-COVID or mm-hmm. pre, pre-BLM or something. Something changed. You, I just drove to Vegas and back. You used to pass 12 cops on the way out, nine mm-hmm. on the way home. You used to have the, the, that radar detector. Yeah, I used to travel the radar detector. I don't see cops along the way anymore, and I'm not seeing them out in Los Angeles, which used to be the worst. Yeah, I think I think pretty much since it's a straightaway, um, there, I'm not saying whatsoever <laughs> that CHP is allowing people to speak. I'm not saying that. I think you got to be on some real dickhead, like like driving super dangerously for them to be like, okay, let me light them up. Like, yeah, but I've, they used to do it with ease all day, every right. day. Yeah, they, I, I'm pretty I sure see people pulled over. Yeah, I'm life. pretty sure Vegas tapped him on the shoulder too. Like, hey, you're uh, <laughs> you're stopping my money, so uh, be like, a buzzkill. Yeah, bro. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, you're stopping the flow. You know, <laughs> we you, see it in the data. See, I had this theory, which is at some point <laughs> the cops just kind of stop being cops, like in the sense that if you got your laptops ripped off. 10 years ago, you'd call the cops right. and they'd go, all right, well, do you have the serial number? Or like, where were you? Now, if you got your laptop ripped off, you <laughs> yeah. would never call the yeah, cops. Right? You yeah. get your car broken into and they te- tear all your luggage out in Oakland or something. You wouldn't even, whoever, if you were going to call the cops, the person next to you would go, don't bother. Right, right, and, right. and then if you got the cops, they'd go, look, there's nothing. We're not going to do anything. So maybe yeah. it's just a tacit agreement. Maybe they just said, look, we're not really going to do any of this stuff, but there's good news. We're not going to pop you yeah. for going 87 and a yeah. 75. A Get there crazy. safely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Like. You know what signs used to freak me out on the way to Vegas? It's like speed enforced by aircraft. Yeah, I don't like what that one either. That? Yeah, I think they're bullshitting. I, I they think they totally uh, are. Yeah. No, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna waste an aircraft to fly over here and check if somebody's gonna make sure you're following the rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe yeah. it's the Southwest flight. Yeah, <laughs> because they're always in the air. Dip, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. They they'd show the plane. It was like a Cessna, like fixed wing thing, uh-huh. and they would report. They would wire it down to the cops on the cops on the ground. The one that always drove me nuts is I would always get pulled over on the grapevine going up north mm. to Laguna Seca, the racetrack, and the grapevine. Half the cops that gave you the ticket. We're not going the direction you were going. They were coming at you yes. with the radar gun on the dash. Mm-hmm. And they're coming at you, and you're doing 90. And all of a sudden, you look in your rear view mirror, and you see the guy do the move where the cop car returns through the dirt yeah. medium yep. there over the grass, does a little fishtail as he gets on it. Then he comes up on you. Well, that's why you're supposed to push it at him. And then that's where you got to go for it. Yeah, you, you got to push it and ball. hop off at the next exit. The part, before, I, yeah. the part I always drove me nuts is when, all right, so the guy eventually pulls you over. Right. Then he goes, you're doing 87 and a 65. Like, do you know how dangerous that is? And I'm like, but do you know how dangerous yeah, you driving? Yeah, you catch me. 
doing a Brody. <laughs> oh, sure. You just shot gravel all over the thing, <laughs> drove through the medium, and then went 115 to catch up to me. I'm the dangerous yeah. part of this <laughs> equation? I don't think so. I think yeah, that's, Look in a mirror, sir. That's yeah. you. Do you get any exhibit out of... I got to be honest with you. The, yeah. the man show... Uh-huh. And being white. Yeah, it got you it's out of It's got me tickets. out of, and yeah. in no particular order. Yeah. <laughs> no, I I used to get, when I was poor and driving a pickup truck, mm. I got the book thrown at me all the yes. time. Then I started doing the man show. Yes. And when I got, after the man show, I got let out of yes. every single ticket. Yes. Do you get the, do you I, get the pimp my ride button? I've had some exhibit perks. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, like, like, yeah they, they don't just show up and get a ticket, though. I, I mean, like, TSA? I'm really popular with TSA people. You know what I'm saying? I get, you know, I got, I, I get to the front of the line. I get let through. I, yeah. yeah. I, it, what about it, when it, you, it shows up in the damnedest of places? Grocery yeah. stores. Weird well, when shit. you get pulled over, I mean, you can't show, you can't get your registration out because your dashboard's a fish tank, right? Yeah, no, right. no, no. Actually, actually, I don't have any of that shit in my car. <laughs> I like my stuff stock. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, no weirdo stuff. You know what I'm saying? I like it stock. Yeah. I, you did put an aquarium in some I chick did, Chanda. I personally, <laughs> thank you very much, I personally didn't put anything in the cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How'd that whole thing, I mean, it was a fun, Pin My Ride was a phenomenon. And then it, it was also a phenomenon because they would start, it was like got milk. Yeah. At, at some point, you'd pass... Uh, an advertisement for a realtor in Sherman Oaks, and it goes, "Got real estate?" Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> come on. But that's what pimp my ride. They yes. go, "Oh, we're going to pimp my house." Yeah, iconic. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah. Isn't that phenomenal? We were able to take. I mean, because traditionally pimps aren't known as being positive people. You know what I'm saying? The like Bishop it's, Don Magic Juan yeah. begs to differ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know the man. Usually. Usually. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Usually. Usually. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Bishop, man. He has um, a weed brand. Absolutely. Does he? <laughs> yeah. It's called church. That tracks, yeah. <laughs> oh, church. Jesus Christ. Have you ever been to his apartment? Yes. He's the only guy I know who lives in a shitty apartment but has a Rolls Royce parked yeah. on the street <laughs> in front of it. It's yeah. called efficiencies. It's a, it's a, it's a Rolls Royce. Gr- He's green, living within his means. Come green here. is for the money. Yeah, the gold is for the honey. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about, I don't know when I brought up Snoop Dogg, but it always cracked me up. Snoop Dogg was there at Bishop Don Magic Wand's apartment in, yeah. in uh, Culver City. Or, yeah, or he has a squirrel, a pet squirrel that comes and talks to him. I mean, he's, he's man, he's, and man, that's a real thing, though. That squirrel comes up there like he belongs there. Sure. I don't know why, but me and Jimmy Kimmel were there yeah. <laughs> getting high with yeah. Snoop and Snoop's weird posse. Like, yeah. Kind of scary posse. They're, they're eating Popeyes, watching TV, getting high, you know. <laughs> And because we were going to do a bit, we did a bit with Snoop, the Man Show did a bit with Snoop Dogg, and then we did a bit with the the Bishop Don Magic Wand, where he took us out, yeah, brought us to his tailor, and yeah, all that travels around with a chalice, yes, yes, you know what I mean. Did and you get yours? You have one, don't you? Now, I had a chalice, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, I don't know. Somebody can find the bit somewhere, but uh, I, I had a chalice. I I went got got outfitted. Uh, What's him? Oh my God! I haven't seen this in 20, 20 years. Oh, what's up? Tonight is a night for learning. Yes. Nice. Now, when we left off, I was wearing a rainbow shoe. Jimmy was baked off his ass, <laughs> and Bishop Don Magic Juan was taking us to buy clothes. Let's rejoin the pimp and the white guys already in progress. Nice. <laughs> oh hell yeah. Homobile. Homobile. Oh. <laughs> Open your eyes clearly. Don't miss none of this game because oh. it's going to put food on your table later. Trust me. <laughs> Scared you're going to get pulled over and charged with an open challenge. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's got the Cadillac. Yeah. You yeah. Know yourself in like it's a wild shopping spree. Is this in Chicago? It's in L.A. Yeah, it's in L.A. Okay. Oh, leisure. Oh, now. Oh, he took you to where they get the real stuff. Wow. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Oh, what? It's not gonna be a flood. Let the pants down. Okay, man. Oh, this yeah. Is not zoo, man. I'm out with the stripes. Come on, go change this, please. Wow, no. <laughs> the Apple right. hat fits you, though. Uh, oh. Wow. This ain't Studio 54. Back to the. All right, you get it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. get it. That was awesome. The thing I always. <laughs> Jimmy went down. <laughs> the, the only thing I remember, because we all got super high. Yeah. I just remember Snoop was right in the middle of negotiations with Cadillac to do a Snoop DeVille. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. He thought he was going to get that. his own pre-pimped car, which has got to be exciting if you're Snoop. Yeah. Because Cadillac's going to come out with a line with your name on it. I mean, <laughs> fuck Eddie Bauer. The Snoop DeVille. You got the Snoop DeVille, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> And at the very end, they must have run it through their marketing department, and they're like, yeah, no, no. no. And he, he found out that day that uh, there will be no Cadillac Snoop DeVille. And he looked at me, and he went, you know, fuck Cadillac. I'm going to GM. Wow. And I was like, GM is Cadillac. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so have fun with GM. Uh, fuck Toyota. I'm going over to Lexus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him. Yeah, no. <laughs> he was pretty but, high. But, but trust me, there's tr plenty of other things that Snoop has his hands in right now he, that make up for that. He's had a a, a crazy career. Who the hell? To. I mean, between uh, him or or Shaq or the Manning brothers, like who the fuck is cashing out? More than I, every commercial either has Shaq, one of the Manning brothers in it, or Snoop doing something. Snoop paired up with Martha Stewart. He's yeah. just everywhere for everything. Yes. I saw a German washing machine commercial where Snoop popped out of the damn washing machine. It was a real like appliance commercial. It was like <laughs> nothing is nothing is off the table here. Oh you know? yeah, that, that, there's just the stuff we see here. I yeah. mean, what's he doing in Asia that yeah. we don't even know about, right? right? God, yeah. how do these guys do it? And the Manning brothers. Yes. The Manning brothers even got their dad involved <laughs> with it now. They got uh, Archie. Archie Manning yeah. in there. They got it, it, it's it, just on every goddamn commercial. Nationwide is on your side. <laughs> They're doing hot sauce commercials. Yeah, They're doing every Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, God, what are they? What do you think? What it's, do you think Shaq makes a year on endorsements? Oh man, I, I'm pretty sure he makes over over a hundred some million just in advertisement alone. Not, not 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 even talking about his like NBA money or what mm -hmm. his investments have been. I'm just talking about advertisements alone. Got to be close to 100. Just crazy. So uh, you start off. Let's see. You're in New Mexico when you're young. No, right? I was actually born in Detroit, Michigan. Oh, well, in Detroit, but you moved yeah. to New Mexico. Yes, right? I did. I did. Um, and uh, you're bored. Yeah, big yeah, rap, pretty big rap much. Scene in New Mexico. <laughs> actually, I got there when I was nine because my mother passed away and my dad got remarried. Mm -hmm. Wanted to. Well, she wanted to live there, so we pack up. We go down there. It was a horrible step family, you know, mm. fucking mommy dearest type mm. situation. Got the hell out of there when I was like 17. Long story short, got into a lot of trouble just just rebelling, you know, as as a kid. So when I got out of there at 17, um, I ended up going straight to California. Um, I had been going back and forth out there. Met a couple. Met a couple like friends. Um, ended up kind of couch surfing with them, just getting my bearing. I just knew I did. I was. I, I wasn't going to survive where I was. Mm -hmm. So, so the time I spent in New Mexico was like you know elementary school, you know a little bit of middle school. Got kicked out of every high school. Um, just became a real bad place for me to be. Uh, still got a lot of friends and family in New Mexico. So I still consider that as part of my growing up experience. But when I got to California, that's where I became a man. I had my children. I found my career. Mm -hmm. I was able to do a lot of the things that made me um, successful here in California. Who were, 
who was a what was early success for you? Who, uh, being, a, being able to buy food on a regular basis mm. was was success. Exotic. Yeah, yeah. It was Congrats, like yeah. wow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Big, yeah. And I didn't have to risk my freedom to do it. You know what I'm saying? So it was it was dope to be able to um first of all take something that I love to do and now it's possibly a career. You know, I, I'm able to take this love for, for hip hop and love for rap music, create my own persona. And at the same time, but like like what I said before, I was I was doing a lot of rebelling. I was very angry when I was a kid. Where was the stepmom not good? No. Nah. It was it was a it was a toxic situation at the at at best. But are you can you I had a stepmom that was like, you know, okay. Yeah. But then, you know, my real mom didn't like me that much. So I, was, I was like, how's my fake mom? Why should she like me? Yeah. My real mom's kind of lukewarm yeah. on me. But you kind of look back and you go, well, I was kind of fucked up and probably acting out. And then yeah. she didn't know what to do. Is there any grace for her? I, I, uh, fuck no. I don't. I, yeah. Yeah, I was fucking nine. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, how bad can you be at nine? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, what was she doing? What was what was she doing that was so uh, just bad? Just very physically abusive. Aww. You know, and 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 you know what? My dad was still alive. So here's what. Here's I think my biggest gripe with all of that. Um, they were very religious. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. So I think the hypocrisy of what I was taught since I was born. In the church, um, and what they their everyday life existence was with us was so off yeah. the mark. Mm-hmm. I think that on top of that, and the, not only just being physically very rough with myself and my sister, um, um, my I had my dad to look at and be like, okay, even though this may be toxic or dysfunctional, I still have someone that I could look at and know that this is how a man is supposed to present himself or a man is supposed to be. Um, she didn't, my sister didn't have that. And I think that's my biggest issue with way, the way we were raised is that she still deals with a lot of those issues today with her um, self-esteem, with her being able to maintain and, and hold on to meaningful relationships. Same way I do. But I think that, you know, there's more grace for me um, because of my celebrity and you know, people are tend to overlook and the and 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 kind of put the bad things on the back burner and celebrate the popularity of of us. And so she, my sister's not famous, so she has to deal with the things that came from our childhood. And I think that's what makes me so um, look at that in such a negative light. But we've done a lot of healing. We've been to therapy. We talk about it on a regular basis. And I think that it says more about them, meaning my parents at the time, my dad and, and you know, my step my stepmom. Are they still around? No, my father passed away, but I think she's still alive. We but once 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 we were done, once I became I I think I had one conversation with her. One conversation. I, I went I went after you became successful. After I became successful. Because she used to have a lot to tell me about who I wasn't gonna be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so so when I actually went back, uh I wanted to talk to her one last time. And you <laughs> she lived in Vegas. I went to her house. She made me meet her at a parking lot of some restaurant first. She didn't want me to come directly to her house. <laughs> so we meet at this parking lot. And I'm sitting in my car. She's inspecting me, looking me up and down, of course, uh, of course. And then she says, okay, follow me. I was like, what the fuck do you think I'm going to do? You think I'm going to fucking jump you? Or is you your like, yeah, like, like, am I wearing a wire? Like, like, <laughs> like is your dad happening? alive at this point? My dad was alive at this point. And they still together? At no, point? absolutely no. not. Oh, okay. um, they divorced like very soon after I left home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we go to her house. And I'm thinking I'm just gonna kind of kind of come have a conversation. She asked me to help clean the garage or do some kind of chore in the house. I was like, yeah, did you, you know, shit never changes. You know what I'm saying? Like, wow. yeah, just control. And so, you know, okay, cool. So I sit down and I finally get to have this conversation. And so I asked her. I said, do you think that everything that you did as my you know, supposedly taking the the place of my mother. 
do you think you did a good job of that? She said, oh, you were raised when I got you. Hmm. At nine. At nine. I was raised when I got you. Okay. And 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 she also, you know, she would always, always say you people when she referred to myself or my sister or my dad. I'm like, why did you stay married to him if you were so, you know, disgusted with us? And then she was like, well, you know, the Bible says this. And I was like, yo, fuck. Yo, you're talking about people who are alive in your face. And you can see that this is not a healthy situation. So, okay, whatever. That was that point. And then her, she said something very telling. Um, I said, do you think that you did a good job raising us? Or do you think that you did everything that you were supposed to do to 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 make us feel as though we were your children? Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't agree with some of the, the, the methods and, you know, the, the corporal punishment. She said, you guys deserved it. You deserve everything that happened to you. And then after that, I said, I got the answer I need. And so I told her, uh, you'll never meet my children. You'll never be able to do the same thing to my children that you've done to me and my sister. Mm. And, you know, I just wanted to come look you in your first you look you in your face one last time to see if there was any kind of humanity or any kind of thing Redemption. that's in you yeah. that that made you anything would have worked. But She's stuck in her ways. And, you know, I, I blame the religion. I blame the, the belief system that they chose to, to, to be into. And it's, and, and, and it's sad because now I see that generation and those people dying off. And, you know, um, when my father passed, um, he was a devout Jehovah's Witness, you know, till like the last few years of his life when he got really ill, when he wasn't able to go peddle those fucking magazines or go door to door and take money and whatever that shit is. So um, when he was, when he was close to passing, he had both his legs amputated from um, diabetes. He had a a gang, he was in Vietnam. uh, So he had a lot of complications with health from being, being exposed to agent orange, um, a lot of different things going on. And none of those people that he had basically sacrificed his family for were there for him. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, and and that was that was that was kind of like the reason why it was so important for me to you know not have that in my life. Like our job as men, if we have families, is to take the things that worked to help us be successful as a childhood. To take the things we got from our parents and implement that into our lives, and leave the leave the other stuff alone. And that's been my job. I was that I was a dad at nineteen. Scared the shit out of me. But I knew that I was going to take that important because of how my childhood was. So hopefully that does so. Well, um, you, you know, your parents, I think the part of that story that struck me was the wild inconsistency part of being very religious mm-hmm. and then coming home and being abusive. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you know, I think a kid can handle consistency, even if it's negative. My yeah. parents were negative, but they were consistent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't have anything to say about Jehovah. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't do anything. But but I understood that's who, who they were. Right. And they didn't treat anyone any differently. It was just sort of bad all the, all the way around. It wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't abusive. They're just not into, into other people. Right. You, you know, but they were super totally consistent right, and if yeah. they had been a certain way in public and then a certain way behind closed doors yeah, that and, would have screwed me up and my even parents more. were teachers oh they, really they were like elementary school teachers so i was like you know how can you have this compassion and all this public service on you and then you come home and treat us like it's the fucking color purple you know what i'm saying <laughs> oh, like no. what in the fuck is happening right here so it was a double standard and and i learned that and again I, it just really like put me in a very angry place so that being said connects us back to the music because now i got a place to kick and scream and curse without hurting myself or others. And now it's turning into something where I can say these things out loud. And believe it or not, big part of therapy is breathing and saying things that out loud that you haven't had the opportunity or the safe place to say. 
So I've been able to do that with hip hop. It's been my it's been my padded room. It's been my it's been my kicking and screaming moment. It's been able to I could scream at the top of my lungs and not put anybody in danger or hurt myself. And 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 I always tell my fans we grew up together. Like I was able to grow up and become a man in front of you. Now I'm not perfect. I did I did I did a lot of screwed up things in in trying to get through this path, but you guys did it with me. And you can relate to it and you bought into it because I was telling the truth and you don't have to sell the truth. You know, this is something that you can do um, and, 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 and you can hear me and hear my pain and hear what I'm saying and find some solace in it. Find some kind of comfort because I know I'm not unique in this experience. Everybody has a different name or a different face, but we're pretty much going through the same shit stains. You know what I'm saying? That's pretty much where we are. Well, I the only part of this I'd like to modify is the part where then you go on and per- perpetuate this stuff with your kids, right. which I have always hated because I always go, well, his dad beat him, so he beats his kids, and nah. his mom is an alcoholic, so he's an alcoholic. No way. She's married. She's attracted to an alcoholic because her dad was an alcoholic. It's like, <laughs> how about we knock that shit off? Yeah. How about you learn some lessons and you go, I'm not doing that to my kids. Correct. Which is. It's a pretty straightforward way to go. Yeah. I, that's what I did. I went, well, I see how my parents treated their kids. Right. Now I'll treat my kids the opposite of the way my parents would have treated their kids and right. did treat their kids. And it's it's a simple equation. I don't know why mo- I, I ask it all the time. I don't know why everyone has to repeat these sins from the past. But if- you got a front row seat to how bad this was. Yeah. Now don't do it again to anyone <laughs> exactly. else because you know, uniquely know how they would feel because yes. you were there. When you were nine, and doing, and, I, and that's exactly what I did. But I also know that my kids have a different set of problems now. They, it, they, it doesn't make them grow up without problems. Now they have a different set of problems. Yeah, like my kids are fucking entitled. Like they're, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like they, they think that they supposed to have stuff without working for it. Like, like success is not on an app. It can be ordered, and it doesn't get dropped off at your your front door. Mm. And just because you're my kid doesn't mean that you automatically get grandfathered into these these lifestyles. Oh like, boy! I want my yeah. I want my kids to know what it is to earn a buck. Yeah. And 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 listen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you what I have because this is my stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like when I'm dead, then you, somebody's gonna come with a briefcase and then open it and read what I have. You know what I'm saying? But for right now, I want you to go out there and find what you love. Find something that you fall in love with the way I fell in love with something. And then you, it, it, and if, if that's the case, trust me, the, everything else will fall in place because you are, are doing this out of love, not out of motivation to be something or be like someone, you know? And once they have that instilled in them, one thing that they got from me is that I show up every day. I get up, I work hard every day. I'm very humble. I don't care what I've achieved. We all shit the same way. You know what I'm saying? When, when we go leave the earth, there's nothing that's going to be behind us that that we can take with us. So the, the only thing that I stress about my kids is time. Don't procrastinate because procrastination is like masturbation. You're fucking yourself. So you have to, you have to have time as your biggest asset. It's not a car, it's not a girl, it's not a look, it's not clothing, it's not any of those things, but how you spend your time will be your legacy. How you raise your kids and what your kids end up doing will be your legacy. Then, then Trust me, there's been way bigger, way richer people. Nobody remembers what they drove. Nobody remembers where they lived. They only remember the people that they helped. And, and, and that's what's going to be you know, my legacy. That's what's going to be what my children get into. And um, and hopefully if that I did that right, then what I've done, I've, do, I've done my job and I feel like I put something into society that is a benefit. Yeah, well, you should be doing a motivational yeah. podcast. <laughs> All right, you guys want to hang out and do it. some news? We've got a little bit of news. Yeah, let's do some do. news. All right, we'll take a quick break. Come back. We'll do some news. And smoke some pot. Smoke some oh. pot. <laughs> right after this. Let me tell you about Angie homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home, whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects. It can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. Your home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience 
bring them your project online or with the Angie app, answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. This go to a living. If you said, this is Spinal Tap. These go to 11. You're correct. Now, back to the show. Tammy and Exhibit are here. The podcast, Lasagna Ganja, is the pod. It's available wherever you find finer podcasts. And uh, Rob Reiner's going to join us in about 19 minutes or so. So we'll do a little news, and then we'll talk to Rob. All right. Yeah, so um, speaking of parental abuse there is a, a father who is also changing his ways another one uh, homer simpson <laughs> oh yeah so he he uh it's very not... lightly in a recent episode yes. basically admitted that he's going to stop strangling bart wow you know that iconic mm-hmm. move that he's been doing for the i was done when years. they stopped doing that poo Oh, with yeah. What's his name? <laughs> don't, I don't need cartoons to be woke cartoons <laughs> yeah. live in a nether world <laughs> Everything, you know, it's not like I could have been influenced by the Flintstones when I was a kid. Like, I'm going to move to Bedrock one day and drive a car with my feet, you know, and, and own a dinosaur. And my, right. my garbage disposal will be a miniature dinosaur. Like, it's all, it's a cartoon. Leave it alone. I can't fly. Superman can fly. It's, yeah. These are comic book characters. <laughs> Leave it alone. You okay. don't need to change with the times. Well, let's watch the scene. So this is Homer, Mead, and uh, Marge meeting their new neighbor, where he kind of alludes to what's going on. Whoa, that's quite a grip. See, Marge? Strangling the boy has paid off. Just kidding. I don't do that anymore. Times have changed. Times have changed. Wow. Now, I mean, look, I'm with you with the Apu thing. I personally never cared for the Homer strangling Bart gag, yeah. ne- and it was ne- I never thought it was funny. I mean, sure, it was iconic, and you, he did it all the time, but yeah, I, if that I don't, gone, I, I don't, really I don't need it. I'm just saying, I have a general disdain for societal whims making their way into things that have been around for a long yes. time. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I don't care if there's a brand, you know, Aunt Jemima pancake. <laughs> Maybe I'm talking the wrong crowd here, but. <laughs> I, I, Uncle Ben's rice. I don't know. He was a guy. He invented a rice. Leave him alone. Yes. It's there. Yes. We I, like Uncle Ben. I, I, I think I think when you try to put, listen, when you buy a product, um, the product is the product. It's what's on the pack, the messaging. I think there is a sensitivity right now that it's like, I don't know where it's going. Team, when, team mascot, when everything, names, yeah. you know. Well, but mean, also it screws over sometimes this well-intentioned stuff. Like, I think Uncle Ben was a real guy, and he was a cook. I mean, he was like yeah, a slave cook. He right. was like a real cook, right. and he invented this rice, and it and became very successful and popular. Right. You're stripping his legacy by yeah. taking him off yeah, of Yeah, and he probably did. It. He probably was an uncle to someone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but, I, I, but, but I think when Aunt Jemima, when they made her get a perm, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, come on. Like, you know what I'm saying? I get it. I get it. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's offensive, but I mean, now we're walking a fine line. Like, people are getting offended by the most craziest shit. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, I, there there has to be some kind of something else. You know right. what I'm saying? Um, that comes in and regulates. Um, do, you, do you ever think about like any of your old songs that could? Oh be- yeah, oh dude, yeah, dude. You listen to my albums, like what? <sighs> Man, it's it's like. Yeah, it's some pretty bad stuff up there. <laughs> yeah, compared to today's right. stuff, but I wouldn't go change it. I mean, this is this is what it was. You that's know, what I'm that's the point. That's, yeah, that's what we're saying. Yeah, we wouldn't change it. I mean, we also used to drive around in Chevy Novas with no, you know, all metal parts and no seatbelts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was like, bro, 
Yeah, like there was no car seats. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. we was just kind of back there. Um, so now, nah, man, I, I I don't do with the whole you know woke stuff and all that stuff because then it just it's a it's a license for people to become offended for whatever reasons. And and you know a lot of the stuff then you didn't have the soapbox to be voicing your opinion to things because basically your opinion didn't fucking matter. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is... This oh, is no. Yeah. Listen, if if there was some version of Greta Thunberg, some snot-nosed <laughs> 16-year-old who decided to pipe up, where everyone when I, in the 70s would have been, hey, bitch, shut up. <laughs> have fun in the ninth grade. Yeah. Keep your opinions yeah. to yourself. Yeah. Like, everybody's got an opinion in a soapbox now, and we're supposed to <laughs> listen to them, mm-hmm. even though they're literally juniors in high school. Right. Right. All right. Yeah, what well, was the story with Uncle Ben? I want to know from uh, Byron. <laughs> well, while, while I was looking that up, I actually recently watched Eight Mile, and I love your yeah. scene at the lunch truck yeah, in yeah, yeah. freestyle where you guys are you guys are battling. So, I mean, a few questions. First off, Eminem. Yes. Um, so, what was your what was your first uh, like? What, what was the first time you heard of him? And like, what was your first thought oh, about? Well, I come from uh, you know the battle rap scene when I first oh, started. Okay. When I first started. Um, uh, on the West Coast, it was like very small cliques of MCs, and we all used to go and like do these, you know, like battles, like either at Unity or we would go up to the Wake Up Show with Tech and Sway, and uh, we would just kind of that was our only outlets. There was no internet, there was no place for us to really do that. And so in New York, they had different things, um, Lyricist Lounge. They had you know mixtapes, and they had a, a vibrant scene. And LA had its own scene as well. So Eminem was very famous for going and being a battle rapper. Um, and so, you know, I've, you know, even even when he was spelled his name with the M and M, like the candy, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like he was he was talented back then and he he was grooming himself. And so everybody was doing the same thing, grooming themselves. And you heard of him, you know, because it was like to see a, a white guy with that much skill um, come into the scene was pretty amazing, and so when you met him, you, you his reputation preceded him. Right, and so that I just met him through through that first. It wasn't like a like we, oh we're gonna work together and do all this stuff later. No, we all both came from the same kind of place, and so once he came for the Rap Olympics, and you know he was ready to throw in a towel at that time, and but his he was giving out tapes. One of the tapes from that. Rap, uh, the Rap Olympics got to Dre and Jimmy. Hmm. Jimmy took it, you know, to Dre, and and then they called him in, and that was history. Yeah. So from there, you know, I got to Dre through a different way, right? But we all ended up in the same kind of camp, and uh, it was all for the same kind of push, and it was all for you know because we were a certain talent, yeah, th- that we brought to that table w- w- with our rhymes. And so that's kind of how we got together and moved on it. But he's been, he's he's had a, he's had a, a, a crazy story as well. So um, I'm glad I was in Eight Mile. I, I was glad I was able to work with him in the capacity that I have. Um, nothing but respect for Marshall and the rest of his team. So it's been crazy for you know all of us to kind of sit back because we'll <laughs> and and look at what it's become because we've never been able to. You know, like sit and know. Oh man, this is gonna be this is gonna be ten times platinum right here. Oh sure. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't know. You don't know you're doing it until you d- it's mm-hmm. done. Right. And then when you when it goes out there to the world and it's received like that, you feel you feel justification. You feel accomplishment. But you know, by no no chance whatsoever did we know that the things that we were doing were going to be received like that. You know, I just wanted to beat all the other rappers in the room. I didn't know I was going to be looked at like, oh, you're going to be this. Yeah. You know, we don't do it for that, though. How important is freestyling um, versus, like, just the written lyric in rap? Like, I mean, because then all rappers are good freestyles, or are they? Right. It depends It depends on what your definition <laughs> of freestyle no. is. No. <laughs> you know, um, when, I, when I write something, I call that a freestyle. Um, even though it's not coming off the top of my head, I can do that, but my writtens are always more complicated than my freestyles. I understand the fundamentals of rhyming, but for me, a freestyle means a, a, a free rhyme. 
Meaning, meaning it doesn't it come it can't come off the top of the head, but it can float into some written and then float back out to connect something else. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's freestyling. That's I, I'm better at that than coming off the top of the head. I can rhyme cat, rat, dog, bat. You know, saying frog, song. You know, like 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 we can do Put that. Put a beat to that, Dawson. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we can do that. But um, but it depends on the artist. You know what I'm saying? Like I would give anything to see the new artist. Um, be a little more comprehensive. I was just going to ask, yeah, like yeah. Where, like where rap is now. Are are you okay with this? I mean, it's definitely changed so much. Yeah. You have like the mumble rap stuff, and you have yeah. like all, all the all the new stuff. Like, what it, you've been in the game for so yeah. long. Where do you see that? Where do you see it going? Uh, I I I think the education system has failed us. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like like comprehension is is everything. Um, and once people started communicating with emojis and farts and, you know what I'm saying, and, and beeps and, and, and you know, comp- in 30 second, you know, intervals, you know, two ten sentence, you know, like you, you're, you're basically dumbing yourself down to communicate with this new language that doesn't give you much room for comprehension or, you know, or expansion, you know, so. Yeah, I think that I, I can't criticize the new rappers because they're look, you, you now you have to you have to get to a, a person who's gonna listen to thirty seconds of what you have to say and 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 try to and try to put a whole album into that is impossible. So, you know, you look at the way the albums are put together, there's three or four songs, five songs that you want to listen to, when there may be 10 songs, 12 songs, you don't get to open it, the, the CD or the record, you don't get to read the producers, you don't get, there's no emotional investment in the music. Like when we were putting music out, you had the CD cover, the album cover, cassette, oh, yeah. you get to open it, you get to see who produced it, it's you like get a to ceremony see, read the lyrics, yeah. Yeah. you know, you're not guessing, you're not, you know. <laughs> right, right. You know, a lot of the things that 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 made us have 10, 15, 20, 30 year long careers doesn't exist anymore. So imagine what it's going to be like 10 years from now when they when they try to do they're going to be like, you know, how, how at the end of the award shows, they show all the people that died that year. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, yeah, the memorial. Like, like people are going to be like, who, who is, you know what I'm saying? They're going to have getting to. getting there, yeah. Yeah, like, who's going to go, who, do you remember that? Like, I, I'm nobody there with remembers all the that. now, so I don't right. even, yeah, I don't even know. Right. It's going to be very difficult to be able to say, okay, now, I, I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or not, but hip hop, it doesn't even have the staying power that it used to have. And it's dominated for the last, I mean, everything. I mean, you see country music having elements of hip hop. You see pop music. When's the last time you saw a rock band that didn't have a hip hop element to it? Like, I, I'm looking for, I'm, I'm sick of hip hop. <laughs> and I love hip hop. You know what I'm saying? I want to see a rock band come out and steamroll. When's the last time we had, you know, what I'm saying a uh, 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 ACDC or a, you know what I'm saying, or, or you know, uh, uh, anything that's, you know, Limp Biscuit or fucking Lincoln Park or, you know, like, like I'll take one of those. You know, because right now I think. The music itself isn't a good representation of what we're supposed to be. Not taking anything away from these kids because they're feeding their families. They're not in the street. They're not doing. Some of them aren't doing anything illegal, but yeah. I still think that <laughs> <Some> there's. <of them. laughs> I think there's. I think there's a there, there's a real path right now for somebody to come out with some real content and have that staying power and show that it's possible. We're hungry for it. Yeah. Uh, I think Rob Reiner's popped on. Oh, okay. So maybe we'll. Uh tweak the news a little bit uh, short. You have Uncle Ben stuff? <laughs> yeah, un- Uncle Ben, the original Uncle Ben was a farmer, and the company asked a chef and a waiter named Frank Brown to be the face, and he was a black man, so it says oh. 26-year-old Byron. Yeah, <laughs> we got that part. <laughs> That's why we're talking about it. Yeah. I the, know the fictional difference. Uncle Ben was a, a, a black man. Yeah, yeah, the original, but yeah. But chef Boyardee, White guy. There you go, (laughs) Myron. Now you know. (laughs) All right. The podcast is called Lasagna Ganja. It's available wherever you find a finer podcast. Tammy Exhibit. Thank you guys uh, so much for coming in. Fun conversation. Yes. Rob Reiner, legendary director and actor on, uh, on Zoom right after this. Hey. I don't know if you guys know, but it's See Better Drive Safer Month now at O'Reilly Auto Parts. They have 
put a spotlight on items to help you see the road more clearly. All month long, receive gift cards after rebate on select wiper blades and bulbs. If your wiper blades are streaking and smearing, well, they're worn out and they need to be replaced. But good news, you can get up to a $20 O'Reilly gift card after rebate with purchase of select wiper blades. The professional parts people will install your new wiper blades and they'll do it for free. See the road better with new bulbs? Get up to a $15 O'Reilly gift card after rebate with the purchase of Sylvania Silver Star Ultra or select ZXE Twin Pack Bulbs. They'll even help you pick out the right bulb for your vehicle. Visit your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store for details. O'Rewards members receive two times O'Rewards points on select bulbs and up to four times points on cleaning supplies for your vehicle. Don't miss the See Better, Drive Safer month. Now at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store or shop online at O'ReillyAuto.com. The Adam Carolla Show presents Rob Reiner's birthday cocktail party for March 6th. Let's see who's invited. Let's welcome Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and poet, the guy responsible for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo. The French playwright and novelist, best known for his large nose, Cyrano de Bergerac is here. The founder of Target Corporation, George Dayton, just joined the party. Who's on first? Well, it's Lou Costello. Johnny Carson's sidekick, Ed McMahon, has joined the party. Economist Alan Greenspan is here. Let's welcome stuntman Hal Needham. From Pink Floyd, let's welcome guitarist David Gilmore. Comedian D.L. Hughley. Shaquille O'Neal just walked in. Tyler, the creator, is here. And the newly convicted founder of cryptocurrency FTX, Sam Bankman Freed. Rob Reiner is on the Adam Carolla Show. Always good to see you, my it's friend. Good to see you. I'm in great company. It sounds like certainly an eclectic group, and so well. Timely. I mean, the only one that there was a you know a Cyrano de Bergerac. I think he was a, a fictional character. I, I think that's a play by Edmund Rostand. I could be wrong, but you know, I don't mind sharing a birthday with a fictional character. I thought he was a fictional character too until I saw that Steve Martin movie. I thought he was, was a, a fictional fireman. character as well, but I trust this website, so maybe I trusted it a little too much. Maybe too much. Well, Rob has doing is doing a podcast. It's a ten parter with uh, Soledad O'Brien, who I've interviewed on the show before. Who killed JFK? It's uh, new. It's on uh, iHeart podcast series, and it's out uh, today as you hear this. It's the 60th anniversary of JFK's assassination, so I want to get into that and see if there's more we can learn about it. I do want to say on a sidebar note that I have been watching the Partridge Family reruns pretty religiously these days, and two nights ago, Rob popped up as Lori's boyfriend, Snake, the yes. biker. Yes, <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, didn't think you didn't you think you knew that about me? No, you? I did not, because I, I think yeah. most people picked up with you at All in the Family. Yes, but they didn't realize the kind of range you had by yes. playing Snake the biker. I was on the, the Beverly biker. Hillbillies. I was on Gomer Pyle. I was on That Girl. I did lots of different different shows. Before I did All in the Family. And I went to Colfax Elementary. I'm the same age as your stepdaughter, Tracy. Oh, my Tracy. God. That's right. Wow. Colfax, yes. And Tra In North Hollywood, right? Tracy was a classmate <laughs> of mine at uh, Colfax Elementary. And I even right. sort of remember the house you guys used to live in back in what is now called Valley Village. Yes, was we lived on Hesby Street. Hesby Street on the corner. I believe. Well, it, I, yeah, my, I don't know if it was exactly on the corner. Yeah, it might have been. It was between uh, uh, Riverside and Magnolia, I believe. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was between Laurel. No, yeah, it was oh, yeah. between Laurel. Laurel right. And, yeah, it was off Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Right. So that's my whole family yeah. lived there. My grandparents, my mom's house. Right. Either way, all, you've been stalking Rob Reiner for a long all time. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the uh, just to show we go way back. Uh, 
this documentary series uh, podcast, what there's more and more coming out about JFK and assassination. And I think when you talk to a lot of people, they seem to be more suspicious now than they ever were. Should, should we be? What well, we yes. Know? I mean, the, the, the strange thing about it is it's 60 years ago and rips and drabs of information has leaked out over the past 60 years. And if you haven't been paying attention, if, you know, I'm like obsessed with this. I was 16 years old when it happened. I remember exactly where I was. It was traumatic. And I remember watching live when Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was killed. The man who was accused of killing the president was killed by Jack Ruby on live television. We all <laughs> saw that happen. The whole thing was very traumatic. So I've been kind of, you know, following it and trying to pick up pieces of it but it has dribbled out over the years and when you start to put it all together it's very very clear that uh lee harvey oswald did not uh act alone it's very very clear i think i think <clears throat> rfk jr has some thoughts about this as well that would probably be in line with with what well, you're a lot thinking. of a lot of people do i yes. mean all you have to do is is look at the evidence and even recently uh, in the last month or so, uh, a Secret Service agent named Paul Landis, who was in the trail car, he was on the running board of the trail car uh, when the when Kennedy was was shot. And he I talked with him on a podcast and you can listen to it. You'll hear about it. He said that the bullet hit Kennedy in the head and the brain matter splattered back. He was about 15 feet behind and all the blame at brain matter came back and it was all, uh, splattered right towards him. And the big relevate revelation that he made was that they raced to Parkland Hospital. And when they were taking Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy out of the car, the back of the, uh, the limousine was bloodstained like crazy. And he looked down and he saw this bullet resting on the back seat, on the upper part of the back seat. And he picked it up because he thought, you know, so it's a piece of evidence, you know, somebody will take it or whatever. And he didn't know what to do with it. He put it in his pocket. He went into the uh, to the emergency room with with everybody else. And he took this bullet out and he put it on the gurney where where Kennedy was being worked on because he thought this would be part of the evidence. Now, he didn't say anything about this for many years. He was traumatized by the whole thing. He was never investigated. He was never questioned by the Warren Commission. They never asked him uh, what he saw or what or, or any of the Secret Service agents, for that matter. And when he saw a picture of this bullet, which is, by the way, you can see the bullet. It's in the archives. It's in a, it's a piece of evidence. It's uh, labeled uh, uh, 399. And it's a bullet that is virtually pristine. Uh, it looks like it was never fired. But Paul Landis recognized when he picked, he says the tip of it had striations on it, which means it was fired. It did come out of a gun. And but it, there it is. And when he saw that picture and this is only recently, he said, that's the bullet. That's my bullet. That's the bullet I saw. And so then he started talking about what happened and, and what, what he could. Now, what is the significance of this bullet? It's huge. It's basically the whole shooting match. Come, I you know hate to use that uh you know, that little thing, shoot Matt. But I mean, it's the whole deal in that the entire Kennedy assassination theory is based on this one bullet that came from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository that was supposedly shot by Lee Harvey Oswald. This is called the single bullet theory, the magic bullet. And ostensibly what this bullet was supposed to do was come from the sixth floor Enter Kennedy's back, because there's a in the autopsy, you see a hole right in his back, which is about six, eight inches below his neck. It goes in the back, according to the theory, which was developed by Arlen Specter, who became a senator from Pennsylvania. He was just a lawyer at the time. The bullet goes in Kennedy's back, six to eight inches below his neck. And then, according to the theory, it travels up and then exits his throat. Once it exits his throat, it makes a turn and then goes into Connolly's back. It then exits Connolly's back. It goes into Connolly's wrist, breaking a couple of bones. It then turns again and winds up in Connolly's thigh. Uh, Governor Connolly, who was sitting in front of President Kennedy. 
So that bullet is supposed to have done all those things. And they have that bullet, they say, was found on a stretcher in Parkland on uh, Governor Connolly's stretcher. That bullet is entered into evidence. There's no way, first of all, that a bullet that broke bones in both Kennedy and Connolly's body could be pristine like that. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't enter a guy's back and then go up and come out his throat. It's ridiculous. But the big coup de grace is the fact that Paul Landis found the bullet in the back seat of the car. So it, it, it's impossible for the bullet to have gone through Kennedy and Connolly and then bounced back and wound up in the back seat. It blows the single bullet theory completely apart. And once that happens, it 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 portends that there was more than just one shooter because every single doctor at Parkland Hospital said that the bullet that entered Kennedy's neck and the one that went in his head were both shot from the front. And so we know that those bullets that killed Kennedy didn't come from from behind, which is where they said uh, Oswald was positioned. I could make your case in a much more succinct fashion. I would say, okay. I would say, okay. listen to me, everybody. I could yeah. give you a lot of documents. I could show you a lot of archival footage. But here's a subject that Tucker Carlson and Rob Reiner both agree on. Need you? Need I say more? They don't agree <laughs> on anything, but they do agree on this. And that's really about all you'd need to hear because it must be true if you two both have landed in the same place and RFK Jr. I don't know we could get RFK Jr., Rob Reiner, and Tucker Carlson on many of the same pages, but there is one thing they agree one on, on that yeah. and that's that is true. this. And that's, <clears throat> it's true. that's compelling I evidence. Agree. I agree with Tucker on more than just one thing, but this thing we do agree on. So then who, what's behind this, and then who is responsible for it? And then are we talking Grassy Knoll stuff, or where's the second shooter? Okay, first of all, you, you, you really need to listen to the podcast because we lay it out completely, and it's not simple. What the act of, of, of the assassination is simple, is very simple, but how we got to that point is complicated and you have to listen to it to understand how it all happened. But based on all the forensic evidence and everything that we've studied in terms of who we know was in Dallas that day, we've identified four shooters, four people, who, four assassins who were present in Dallas on that day. We know they were there and we name them in the podcast and we also name the positions they were in we don't know which of them was in which position but we do name the positions. the positions i will can lay it out for you the the sixth floor of the school book depository was one of the positions what we know as the grassy knoll uh which is on the north side of dealey plaza that was another position but there was also another position directly behind the president across the street Houston Street, that's the Dal Tex building. And then the what we believe is the the kill shot, the shot that eventually uh, 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 killed the president came from the South Knoll. And that's on the opposite side of where the grassy knoll is. And for years, I was trying to understand this. I've been to the Dealey Plaza many, many times, looked at it over and over. And it wasn't until I talked to a fellow named Tosh Plumley, who we also interview in the in the in the podcast tosh was a cia operative who was a pilot who that day flew to dallas e howard hunt who was a member of the cia you heard that name from watergate you know that e howard hunt was the head of the plumbers that broke into watergate he flew e howard hunt and johnny roselli who was a mobster who was connected to you know to, to, to the italian mafia he flew those two guys to Dallas that day and then was given the assignment to go to the South Knoll with a walkie talkie to see if he saw anything unusual. He didn't know what was going on. He was on a need to know basis, and that's all he was told to do. 
when the shooting started, he was mortified. He couldn't believe what was happening. And he said one of the shots came from the area where he was, which was the South Knoll. And when you look at it and you study where uh, Kennedy was positioned that time, it's the only place that makes sense where Kennedy would have been hit on the right side of his head and the and a big hole was blown out the backside of his skull, which is what every single doctor in Parkland Hospital said. What do they do? And I always get a little suspicious when they seal records and then they go, we'll open them in 50 years. And then 50 years comes and goes and they don't open them. And then they go, we'll open them in 100 years. We just have to wait till everyone's dead (laughs) who could have possibly been involved with this. And it's like, well, what's in those records? And then why would everyone have to be dead? And then what is indicting about those records? And why are we kicking the can down the road on the sealed records? And are they still sealed? Well, there are about almost 5,000 documents that are still sealed. Documents have been released over the years in drips and drabs. There was a law that was passed, uh, the uh, Assassination Records Act, that required that 25 years from that point, all the records would be released. And that was supposed to be uh, in in 1917, uh, excuse me, 2017. And some records, uh, Trump just said, I'm not going to release these records. Biden released some of the records. These re- records have dribbled out over the years. But even at Biden decided there are going to be almost 5,000 records that are not going to be seen. Now, certain things have been revealed over the course of the years. And only people who are paying attention and really looking at what's in those records can kind of understand it. The first thing we found out is that in the Warren Commission, they said the CIA had no uh, connection with Lee Harvey Oswald. They didn't really know who, you know, he was a a lone, uh, you know, assassin. In the records that are, are released a while ago, there was a 201 file open on on Lee Harvey Oswald. And there are thousands of pages about the CIA's connection, tracking Oswald. They knew everything about it from the time he went to Russia, from the time he came back, from the time he got his job at the book depository. They know everything about it. Another piece of information came out. And this, you know, you got to get in the weeds for all this to kind of understand and put it together. But it came out that During the 70s, they did another investigation on Kennedy. They opened, they reopened the investigation. And that committee, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, found that it was a conspiracy. So that goes in uh, in opposition to what the Warren Commission said, which was it was a lone gunman. But what came out after that investigation is that there was a man assigned to that investigation named George Joannides. Nobody's ever heard that name. I guarantee you, you've never heard of that name. George Joannides was a CIA agent, an ex-CIA agent who oversaw the program that developed people like Lee Harvey Oswald. He knew Lee Harvey Oswald. He knew there was that Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a program that was designed to uh, uh, create assets for the CIA, he was the gatekeeper to that investigation and the liaison to the CIA. So we talked to the guy who was the counsel to the CIA, Robert Blakey. And we and when he found that out, because he gave he gave the report that it was a conspiracy, but he didn't know who did it. They were trying to get information from the CIA. They never got it. And the reason they didn't got it, didn't get it is because the guy who was knew about it, was standing right. He says, if I had known then what I know now, I would have put that guy on the stand. He was the answer to so many of our questions. So that came out in the uh, in the report. So, I mean, I mean, in the in the uh, release of records. So we don't know what's in the last 5000. But I guarantee you, if you look at the 60 years and all the information that's come out and you start to put it together, uh, it's very, very clear what happened that day. Well, what would Trump first and then Biden second say if you just confronted them and said, why after 60 years are these things still sealed? Well, it's it's the CIA has asked for them to be sealed. The CIA, they talk about, you know, 
methods and you know uh you know methods and and, and, and all this stuff and they don't want to reveal uh sources and methods you know that's the thing you always hear but these people are all dead right I mean, you know they've been dead for a long time so i mean what are they hiding i mean what is what is there to be hide the only thing they're hiding and there's not going to be a smoking gun in there that says this guy talked to this guy and this guy. you know it's not going to be like that but there'll be more information about the CIA's involvement is my guess. So, you know, I think we I think we can all reasonably say, look, there's more here than the lone gunman, the disgruntled American who um, decided to kill the president of the United States. I, OK, there's there's a lot more meat on the bone. And we how that's pretty much established. Some people are 100 percent. Some people are 65 percent. But I think everyone reasonably knows that it wasn't as originally portrayed. So then the right. next and question. We, and and yeah. just yeah, before you get to the question, just so you know now, where we sit now, about 61% of Americans think it was a conspiracy. When the Warren Commission first came out, virtually everybody bought the Warren Commission that it was a lone gunman. Then when people started questioning, Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, came out, Mort Saul, people started questioning all this. Dick Gregory went on Geraldo, and they showed the Zapruder film for the first time. It all of a sudden slipped up to about 80, 81 percent believed it was a conspiracy. Where we sit right now, it's about 61 percent. Wow. Dick Gregory goes on Geraldo. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So... Yeah. um but now, then my next question is always motivation. Okay, yeah. so now he was assassinated, and it wasn't just a lone wolf crazed man, and a lot of CIA stuff going around. So then what was in it for them? Or okay, what's so in it for the, anybody to have him gone? Right, right. And, and the way we uh, present the uh, podcast, we talk about it as the greatest murder mystery in the history of America, which it is. Yeah, You know, we has been solved. And so how do you solve a mur murder mystery? The first thing you do is who has the motive? You look at suspects. Who are the people who are most motivated to do what they did? Then you look at the forensics. And we do all of those things in the course of the of the podcast. So as far as motive is concerned, there are three groups of people that are completely motivated. One is you've got Q the Cuban exiles. These are people that fled Cuba in 1959 when Castro took over and kicked out Batista, who was running Castro, the, I mean, uh, running Cuba. These people fled to, uh, to the shores of America, Miami and New Orleans for the most part, and they wanted their country back. They wanted to, they, they started organizing and a very famous uh, invasion in 1961 called the Bay of Pigs. The Bay of Pigs was an operation that was the Cuban exiles trained by the CIA to go back into Cuba and take it, take it back from Castro. The problem was the CIA who had orchestrated this, uh, this attack that was developed under the Eisenhower Nixon administration was inherited by Kennedy. He was only in office for two, three months when this happened. So he went along with it because he was, uh, you know, wanted to prove his bona fides as an anti-communist, cold warrior, tough on communism guy. And so it went through the CIA and the military assumed that once the invasion was made, Kennedy would send air support. He would send planes to help them out and take Cuba back. Kennedy, prior to this, said I'm, I don't want any fingerprints on this. I don't want American fingerprints on this. If it looks like the Cubans are going back to take their own country, fine, but I'm not going to send air support. So he didn't. And those Cuban exiles got slaughtered on the beaches in, in Cuba. So the Cuban exiles were furious, furious at Kennedy for not helping them take back Cuba. That's number one. Number two, you've got the mob, the mafia. Now, in 1950, before 1959, in the takeover of Castro, the mafia was sitting pretty in Cuba. They had casinos. They had hotels. They were running uh, drugs and prostitution. It was a gold mine for them. And all of a sudden, they're thrown out. They lose everything. And they are upset about that. 
And then they become even more upset when Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, John's brother, starts going after the mob and putting them in jail and prosecuting them. Famous story about how he prosecuted Marcello, uh, Carlos Marcello, who was the mob boss in New Orleans. He couldn't figure out a way to get him. He decided, what am I going to do? I'm going to deport him. I'm going to kick him out of the country. He sends somebody down to New Orleans. He picks up Marcello. He flies him into Guatemala. He drops him in the in the jungle there, and he leaves him there. Wow. And then two months later, he gets flown back. So you've got the mob. That's number two. Then the third is the CIA. They, the hardliners, hardliners in the sea, not all the members of the CIA, because it ultimately becomes a rogue operation. The hardliners in the CIA and the military think Kennedy is going weak on communism. Not only did he not back them up on the Bay of Pigs, but then the biggie comes up. The Cuban Missile Crisis, 1962, and they discovered that there are atomic weapons, military atomic missiles 90 miles away in Cuba that the Russians put there after the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy finds this out. And all the hardliners in his in his administration saying, now's the time. Attack. Attack Cuba and do this. Kennedy is frightened that it's going to cause a nuclear disaster. World War Three. Hundreds of millions of people are going to die. And what does he do? He starts back channeling with Khrushchev, sending letters back and forth. They cut a deal. Khrushchev takes the Cuban the missiles out of Cuba. Kennedy takes the missiles out of Turkey, which we had uh, missiles in Turkey. They agree and they make peace. The, 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 the hardliners are furious at this because they think Kennedy has now gone soft on communism. And then they find out he's back channeling to Castro to try to make peace with Castro. So you have those three elements together are the ones with the biggest motive. So what part and just a sidebar because you seem like you have a photographic memory, Rob. Uh, I don't have a photographic memory. What I do is I have 60 years of thinking about this for a long, long, long time. Yeah. And yeah. it's taken all these years to put all these pieces together. But everybody who is accused of having a photographic memory always says, I don't have a photographic memory. And then they just prattle off a thousand dates, names, and times. And I go, maybe you do. But yeah. uh, not not to do with the Kennedy assassination, but as you were naming all these names and all these dates and all these times, I was thinking about uh, Carl Reiner, your dad, right? Yes, yes. And there was a doc, you know, a few years ago about him. I don't know. How old is he now? No, he pa he oh. passed away. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's okay. He passed away in, uh, in 2020. Okay. I remember seeing a doc going, how are these guys so sharp, so deep into their life? Is it yeah. all genetics? I mean, your dad passed in his later He was 98. 90s? He was 98, 98 years old. And He's he was sharp. Sharp. Very sharp right up to the end. That, that's what I'm saying. And I think yeah. that's a sort of genetic blessing you can have. But yeah, also, it's a, it's a workout. He was up on his feet. He was thinking. He was writing. He was creating. Yeah. He was yeah, yeah. making jokes. And I... I, and I know you have his genetics, but I also think you have his sort of work ethic, which is, you know, it's a kind of if you do 30 push ups every day, then when are you going to not be able to do 30 push ups? You know, just yeah, get yeah, up yeah. every day and work that brain out. So uh, my friend, I have a friend, you know, friend, Nick Pileggi, mm -hmm. Nick Pileggi uh, yes. is a great writer. He wrote yeah. uh, New uh, York uh, guy. Good, good fellas. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, he's written stuff, uh, a lot of great stuff over the years. Wise guys. Um, he's 91 now, and he does 600 sit-ups every day. Wow. I, every day. I, that's incredible. So anyway, that, that's a tip of the cap to you. I think yeah. you have the genetics, oh, but I also think working the brain out on a daily basis, not necessarily doing the sit-ups, but doing the sort of mental sit-ups every day just well i you know you i sharp. do i do the crossword puzzle every day i do sudoku i do uh, spelling bee i do all these things i i don't know if it helps uh it's fun i enjoy doing it and, i i can uh, i can tell uh, look i mean you're not old you're not young 
but you know, you're you're on the older side of young. I'm a I'm a middle aged old person. That's right. And this and is the way I thought about it. When I turned sixty, it was very depressing for me because I thought, oh, wait a minute. I'm now a very, very, very young old person <laughs> because, you know, if you lift a 90, that, you know, it's the so now I'm a middle aged, middle aged old person. Yeah, well, it's funny. You can you can keep the middle age moniker going for a long time. But if you really do the middle age math when you're 60, no one's making it to a buck 20. You're not at the middle. You're yeah. at no, no, but no. But I'm saying at, at, at 76, I'm a middle aged old person. yes old, i yeah. completely you know what i'm saying no no See, i get you i'm saying personally yeah, yeah. middle age stops about eh, it stops about 42 and then you're right, getting into the right. second part right. statistically right. But for an old person yeah. yeah no i'm an old person there's no question about it but i'm a middle-aged yeah. old person. but you're working you're working it because uh, you're you should you're be doing this docuseries like you should be the guy that and we're happy that you're the one doing it yes yeah well it's me it's actually me and the solo that right. o'brien the two of us uh, are presenting it together. I have a question for both of you. So do you think it generally helps or hurts the American public to keep documents like this uh, sealed? Because, like, for instance, that the Nashville shooter manifesto was leaked yesterday, and everybody's freaking out about that, and that was kept secret from the, the public as well. So do is it does it help or hurt? I think, I think if oh, you gone, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Al. Okay, I think sure. if, I think if you went back 50 years before all, everyone had an iPhone and Twitter and can communicate and all this stuff, maybe you could do this kind of stuff 50 years ago. Kind of keep a lid on things, you know. Senator so and so is gay, but nobody knows, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this guy's in a wheelchair, but uh, nobody knows he's in a wheelchair. You know, this guy right. has a couple of mistresses, but nobody knows. You can't do it now. So we're in the we're in the come clean ring doorbell phase of life, which is you got to just put it out there because the problem is, is you look no further than uh, the Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Oh, yeah, he got intruder. hit in the head with a yeah. hammer. He got hit in the head hammer. And then there was like, where's the footage? And then this news guy got fired because he said something. And then everyone started to get suspicious. Right. What's going on? And. It doesn't seem like anything was going on, but it's you with a guy, a guy broke into his house and hit him with, and a, hit hammer. Him with a hammer, but yeah. they sat on some of the information and they argued about letting out other pieces of information. And it got all the tinfoil hat people on the right all riled up to think something was going on. So we're now at the phase we're thinking something is going on is worse, <laughs> and now everything just needs to be pushed out there. Yeah, and no, I think you're right. And I think the problem we have is, you know, we're in an age of, uh, you know, incredible disinformation. And because of social media, uh, I was just at this conference where the, all these experts in AI were talking about um, what can be done and how uh, you can affect disinformation, how easy it is to push things out that are not true and they don't have a solution as to how to rein that in. I mean, it's it seems like it's proliferating and getting out there. I agree with you, Adam. You ha we have to get the truth out there. Th there will be no democracy unless it's based on some level. We all have to agree that two plus two is four. Yes. If we don't, then we can't have a discussion about anything. And so right now you've got so much information flying out there on on social media and a lot of it is not true and it's hard to check what is true, but I agree with you. We we have to get truth out. Democracy is based on the public knowing what the truth is about things. Agreed. So in our last few minutes, where predictions and what so when you say the CIA there's a, there's kind of two CIAs. There's the rank and file street soldier type people that it's never yeah. them. FBI, same thing. Then there's the top of the top who like to keep their hands a little clean. Uh, and then there's, you know, plausible deniability. And then there's a kind of a lower, lower tier shadow kind of level that is kind of doing what they're doing. And maybe the top knows what they're doing, but they're just sort of playing dumb. They're doing the dirty work and the rank and file people don't know anything about this. But it's close to what actually happened. And I I talked with a uh, an ex-CIA agent who's also on the show and he said it has all the earmarks of a rogue operation. In other words, there are 
people who are attached, connected in some way, who decide to do this on their own. And it doesn't take many people to do it. What it does take is an, a, an organization to cover it up. But if you know that it can be traced back to the CIA in some way, that they'll close ranks and make sure that nobody knows about it. And he told me about operations that they have conducted over the years. And that's all came out, by the way, in the 70s during the church uh, uh, c committee hearings. Frank, Frank Church from Idaho, a senator, had these hearings and it came out that the CIA had done all these extra judicial killings. The uh, Lumumba, uh, Trujillo, a number of uh, dictators around the world. And so we know that they have the uh, capability of doing it. We've seen now uh, plans that would have been released. You can read, a, read them, Operation Northwoods and Operation ZR Rifle shows how they do it. And all it takes is two or three people to say, you know, we're going to do this. And, and they do it. And then... And what? there's no accountability. There's right. no tracing back. There's no, uh, you know, uh, there, there's no way to trace it back to any kind of official plan. Yeah. And they would close ranks, like you said. Yeah. So even if yeah. the very top of the top wasn't aware of it, yeah. once they are and it's happened, they protect their own. Mm -hmm. That's right. And not a lot of whistleblowing going on back then. Right. Uh, but maybe there was. Is there any case of you hear about whistleblowers now? Where, uh, could you blow a whistle back then without being killed? Uh, no, and that's the un, that's the, another part of it. We didn't get into it because a lot of people got killed. D d the two years uh, after the Warren Commission, the two years, excuse me, after Kennedy was assassinated, 18 key witnesses died of either a heart attack or an accident or suicide, and we know a lot of them that that wound up dead. So uh, Johnny Roselli was one. Uh, there's another guy named George de Mornchild. There's a whole bunch of them that got killed. And, uh, you know, it, it is dangerous, you know, and there were people that wouldn't talk, you know, people that would, you know, wouldn't talk to us or were nervous about talking to us that did talk to us. We didn't put them all in there because, you know, they're worried. You know, one guy uh, was worried who was running a, uh, an operation, an anti uh, Castro operation out of out of Miami, and uh, he knew Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, he was the same guy was handling him was handling Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, when he talked about it, he went to this commission in the seventies, and somebody shot him in the head. You know, I mean, he didn't die, but he got shot in the head. You know, I mean, so things like that happened a lot. So it it was scary. You know, my wife, when I got involved in doing this, and she's as she's as committed to me uh, this as I am, but she said, "Are you worried that something's going to happen to you that you bring all this stuff up?" I said, uh, "I don't know, but I mean, you know, you gotta you gotta pursue the truth." Uh, uh, and like I say in the uh, in the podcast, we can handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question: uh, yeah. Oliver Stone's RFK or JFK? You mean JFK? Sorry, JFK, yeah, uh, yeah. I've never I've never watched a movie, but when you watch it now, if you watched it tonight, would you go, "Oh, they got that right," or they completely screwed the pooch on that one? Yeah, well, he he laid out a very broad. Uh, scenario. I mean, he threw the kitchen sink at it, and he didn't say specifically how it was done. It was all about the trial that uh, Jim Garrison does, you know, uh, it, down in New Orleans. But the general idea of uh, rogue elements of all of those uh, motives, all of those uh, groups that had motives, he did talk about that. Um, and some of it, you know, is very accurate. Listen, his movie gave birth to the Assassination Records Review Board, wow. which started a review of all the d documents. And they were responsible for getting a lot of these documents released. And by the way, that's when the uh, Records Act came out and said, within 25 years, all these documents have to come out. That was a result of uh, uh, Oliver's movie. Uh, the podcast is called Who Killed JFK? It's a 10-parter. Soledad O'Brien is... Uh very, very decorated journalist is also involved in Rob, who seems to just be an encyclopedia of this subject. So I recommend it highly. You can find it wherever you listen to a finer podcasts. It's a new iHeart podcast series. 
and it is out as you hear this. Uh, Rob, always great catching up with you. Yeah. Thanks, if, Adam. Thanks for having me. If you see Tracy, tell her, uh, give her my love. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, we'll hope to have you on as soon as you have anything you want to talk about. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much. Take care, Rob. Okay. All right. Let's see. We know what that is. We know uh, Tammy Pettigrew, uh, Pettigrew, sorry. The Cannabis Cutie. The Cannabis Cutie, an exhibit as well. Lasagna Ganja is where you go. Uh, Sacramento, only tickets left to the Late Show Friday. So that's about it. So that's uh, November 17th, 18th, but it's just uh, 17th Late Show. That's it. The rest are sold out. Yeah, it's punchline. Uh, Fargo, Fargo Theater. And uh, that's uh, November 30th in Nashville Zanies. That's coming up December 1st and 2nd. And uh, Rancho Mirage at the Agua Caliento. Second show got added. That's December 16th. You can go to amcrow.com for all the live shows. Until next time, Adam Crow for Rob Reiner and Exhibit and Tammy Pettigrew and Max Pata saying mahalo. Mahalo.